What I can do is stop being responsible for what's going on with this person. Okay. We use six steps. Education and knowledge of the disease of alcoholism and enabling. And it's incredible how many people just don't know anything about it. They don't understand what's been going on with them. And it's amazing when, they, when you start using various lectures and films and, you know, you hear the person saying, aha, uh -huh. wow, that's, hey, that's been happening to me. You know. We start building self-worth by making them do their own work, make their own decisions, uh, and we try to get them into long-term support involvement, the best that I know being Al-Anon. What do they learn in Al-Anon? They learn they aren't alone. See, they learn that they are not alone. And in this regard, they're exactly like the chemical dependent person. One of the toughest things to do is to somehow get through to this poor wretch that he is not unique. That he's not the worst person that's ever lived. You know? Is this a recovery for an enabler, or is this what I Enabler. This is, we're talking about the enabler. Well, I'm thinking of making them do their own work and making them have, um, making them feel good about themselves, like the payoff would be like that. Well, no, because the payoff just never will succeed. Mm -hmm. It just never goes far enough. There's, you know, it never works. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 will, it will work to the extent that it will keep me sick, you know, and I'll... But, but I'm also getting sicker in the same progressive way that the alcoholic does. So I reach a point eventually where I, I can't make that work anymore. High instance of suicide, incidentally, among, among codependents. Very high. Why? Because my own feeling of self-worth reaches a low, and suicide anyway is the ultimate anger. It's the ultimate anger. Most of all, I'm angry with me. I'm angry with all of you. If he's out there, I'm angry with him. If he really cared, why is he letting this happen to me? That sort of irrational, deluded thinking. They have to get aware, become aware, of what's happening in the enabling process. That when they enable, it produces that. When they do this, it produces that. And really, for the first time, start seeing that when the alcoholic acts and they react and vice versa, that it produces a predictable reaction. The ballet has to stop. One of the dancers has to stop dancing. And they need to know how to, to react to their particular alcoholic. This is so important. Remember I said how we say, I don't drink in the morning, so I must not be an alcoholic. I don't drink beer. And I don't drink hard liquor. I only drink beer. I don't drink, you know, la da 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 da. I must not be because alcoholic is always somebody that doesn't drink like me. See? And since each one is different, then the reaction of the enabler has to be different. You know, we have to learn, we have to help them adapt to the reaction of this particular one. Now, this is left to a, a you know, best left to a professional, but I think that. It's a skill that's learned. You know, uh, be, I put a bibliography in here, but I want to call to your attention and strongly recommend two books. And uh, they're orderable through Walden Books. One of them's called Another Chance, Hope and Help for the Alcoholic Family. I've got it on your list by Sharon Wagscheider. And it's probably the best that I've seen. Sharon worked with Virginia Satir for quite some time, one of the outstanding uh, people in designing the real, what I think, viable model of the family and the way it works. And the other book is, I've already mentioned, is I'll Quit Tomorrow by Vernon Johnson, Dr. Divinity. Okay, I've got to change my behavior as, as an enabler to recover. It's one thing to become self-aware, and it's something the hardest of all to change it. You know, if we believe that man's triangular, <coughs> He's made up of emotions, attitudes, and behavior. You know, that's one way of looking at man. Then I can change the behavior. I've got to change the behavior 
and 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 or I got to change. I got to start changing all of that in order to have, be content with what's happening to me. Behavior sometimes is the hardest thing to change because he's still doing it. You know, he's still doing the crazy thing. I've been reacting. It's been working. Okay. Everybody goes through those first stages. <coughs> Excuse me. We can start getting them strong enough to begin to confront the chemically dependent person. Something they've never been able to effectively do. You see, one of the ways I can keep you away from me is if you mention drinking, I'll cloud up and rain all over you. And I can control you in a variety of ways. Here's one of them. It may not be physical violence. It's just that when you start talking about drinking, I'll make things so unpleasant around the house. You won't talk about it anymore. Okay. The spouse, the enabler, the codependent, has to let go spiritually. So good to be talking to pastors. I don't have to go in through that with the back door. A lot of professionals have to dance all around for and get into the spirituality aspect of this. Okay, I'm going to read this directly. It's the most difficult concept to understand because it's not an intellectual process. Once you do understand it, it's twice as hard to practice it. Giving up the fight to gain control and protect another person from their feelings. Because we never succeed in trying to control another person, control another person's feelings. You know, you know, we say to the chemically dependent person, my friend, when you give up this relationship to your drug, you're going through grief. Can you buy that? My primary relationship, ladies and gentlemen, was to my chemical. I love my children very much, but not enough not to drink. What I go through in grief, all of you that read, you know, Cooper Ross, know that we go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. We go through those things. The codependent person goes through a letting go stage that's dripping with grief. Because it means that even if he dies, I can't save him. And let me tell you, that's not easy. I'm especially cognizant of what happens to our children. I've got six. Okay. One junkie and two drunks thus far. And let me tell you, it's not easy to say, I can't fix my own child. But I can. I can love him and I can pray for him. And I can be there in a positive way, but I won't help him stay drunk. <clears throat> So what I do, I go to our online meetings. You can believe I do. So i got to see it from the other side, too. It's very easy for me to be an enabler with my own children. When I do let go, I feel guilty, and I have a deep, deep sense of loss, don't I? First of all, who am I going to worry about and take care of now? I've exhausted myself all these years being all things to all people in my family, and now I don't have any role. And that's tough to let go of. But isn't this the way you were taught to, to a large extent in our society? Well, uh, probably, you yeah. You are responsible for rather than to. Yeah. You know, when we grow up being men, all of a sudden we are responsible for a whole bunch more instead of two. Yeah, yeah. But you know, what I've got to accept is beyond a certain point, I cannot 
control my children. Nobody can. This is why I like Fritz Pearls when he says, you know, I'm not responsible. I cannot live up to your expectations of me. And you can't live up to my expectations of you. Is the fact that biblically it says that the things of the Father are different from the children, does that make it doubly hard for you? I have to believe that that's the source of all mental illness. Okay? I mean, I don't know whether Adam and Eve lived or whether it's there is a great example for us. I don't know. No, I, I, I just know what happened to their first children when I'm killed. I don't. Problem, thank you. Yeah. 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 You, you say, uh, I contributed to you know, you, you, It's hard not to say that, isn't it? You betcha. Yeah. You betcha. It looks like, you know, if I had an alcoholic father and uh, the way he would live and act, Look like I would say, well, I don't want to. Sure does look like it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like so it. Except that in a study done of 4,000 wives of alcoholics, 62% of them were daughters of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And doesn't the study show that you can inherit the family without following Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. But, you know, even if I, you know, again, drawing on myself, if I may, my mother's 77. I mean, a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, you know. I mean, a militant anti-drink person. See? All of her brothers were drunk. You know, two of them got sober through AA. Way back in the early days, one died in a storefront in Los Angeles. You know, a bum. <clears throat> Hated drink. When we put her in a nursing home, the little deer was on three or four different tranquilizers from three or four different doctors. She had found her booze. She was eating it. Okay? Remember, it doesn't matter what the chemical is. It might come out in another way. I might eat myself to death. Okay? Same dynamics. I might become compulsively involved in my work and feel every day from the time when I got a friend that's 18 hour a day person. And as soon as one of those things that's taking so much time gets out of the way and you think, Whew, boy, maybe this person will have some time to breathe down, you pick up another project. What about the person who gives up chemicals and gets hooked on the lithium or something else? That's what? Gets off of chemicals and gets hooked on the lithium or something else, this is radically hurt. It's transparent. We see that. I had a case like this in Texas that I'm aware of, and I was traveling with a lot of time against the hospital, and one of these guys came back in Vietnam, and he got real gung ho about religion. And uh, everybody on the staff got so upset about it. They were more comfortable with him on drugs than we were on religion. And so it's a matter of rechanneling and educating a little bit. I, I'd, I'd much rather have him as a religious fanatic than as a drug fanatic. Yeah, at the same time, how many of you professional pastors, you know? How many of you are not frightened by the zealot? Oh, boy, deliver me from the guy that, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I think so, yeah. yeah but, but then a lot of things are, you know, when you get right down to it. Okay. Right. Let me pick up there and go back to something you said much earlier. Sure. About the willpower. Where does willpower come in here now? Uh, there's, am I going to, uh, where does it come in my, keep from me from overeating, indulgence? Where does willpower work in here now? I think that, that, that essentially we go through the process, and I'm going to cover this in the 12 steps. Of that. I'll go through some kind of process like this. For whatever the reason, I'm powerless over my, my, my control of, of, of the intake of my food. I don't want to eat like this. I know it's killing me. I'm getting a fat heart. I'm putting cholesterol. My veins are like, you know, I can't see through them. And it's making my life unmanageable. And if you've ever talked to a person that's genuinely obese, you know, I have a patient that's, uh, that's 13. And she's 198 pounds. One very unhappy young lady. You know. It's interesting that she's from three generations of alcoholics. 
very interesting to me. I think that I've got to, to uh, get it out of my hands. We'll get into that a lot. Some depth. Uh, the, the enabler's way out is trust in others. In, in, in a, then I learned to trust myself in a real way, and I learned to put my faith in a power outside of me. It's safe for me to say, God, here to you guys. You know, I've got to recognize that I can't control or make other people well. And that I can't even get well by myself because I'm in terrible shape. Who of us can? And I think that we hope never any meetings I've ever been to with the Serenity Prayer. And, and we didn't originate it, but we sure use it. And and I think that when the the enabler accepts the fact that they want to ask God for strength to accept things they can't change, i.e., the alcoholism of the of their loved one, and the courage to change the things they can, I can intervene, given the right circumstances and the right training, the right time, and the wisdom know the difference. I can't spend any more time on enabling because I'm going to go right on into the family of the alcoholic per se, and uh, and I've already shot my bolt on some of the, the family because uh, uh, the principal enabler and the principal person in the family is the codependent. Let me. Uh, this is a wheel. Looks like a rectangle to you, but that's not a rectangle. It's a wheel, and it's what we call a whole person wheel. Uh, one way of looking at uh, the personal aspects of the healthy <clears throat> emotional person. And we say that it involves feelings, the will, my mental capacity, my social and my physical capacity, and right in the center is my spirituality. Let me differentiate, you know, from that between religion. Religion involves spirituality. Spirituality may not involve religion. What you buy that as pastors? Okay. The healthy emotional person, the feelings, the development of the power to express all of my feelings all of the time in an appropriate way. You know, because let me tell you something about feelings. They're neither right nor wrong, they just are. I don't care what the feeling is. Anger, love, lust, whatever. The feeling's not right or wrong. What I do with it might be, but the feeling is just a feeling. My ability to express that feeling is going, my, my expression of that emotion is going to come out appropriately or inappropriately. But it will come out. Anger will be manifest either by saying, hey, look, that makes me very angry. I'm not going to tolerate that anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe just walking off and yelling at the top of your voice. <laughs> Inventing it, or you're going to carry around maybe an ulcer. The feeling will make itself manifest. The healthy person is able to express all their feelings all of the time. Mind you now, doesn't mean that if you make me angry, I'm going to express it by punching you in the mouth. Because you see, I'm taking the feeling into inappropriate behavior. That's another thing. My will <clears throat> simply means that a, that a healthy person takes responsibility for himself choosing to accept my perceptions to decide to respond or not to respond or to follow through. In other words, I ex exercise my will mentally. Healthily, I can learn, I can plan, I can dream, I can imagine, I can fantasize. That unique little spark that makes us human. Dream pretty dreams. Fantasize pretty fantasies. It isn't thought of being a bishop. Being national general of the army. Winning the Medal of Honor. Those are harmless little fantasies. As long as I don't start building my life around the possibility that might happen, I might get killed if I do that. <laughs> it's the Medal of Honor I'm after. Social. 
the healthy person can make and maintain meaning, meaningful relationships. A friend is a friend. I can be a friend. And I can receive your love and friendship. Physically, I can express my power through my body, my sexuality, my health, my movement, my surroundings. Spiritually, means that unique thing that I as a, as, have as a human to wonder what I mean. Who am I? Why am I? What am I? You know, a channel to an outside power, a higher power of powers. You know, I am convinced that every human being who's ever lived has that searching desire in them. I feel a little absurd talking to pastors about that, but it's true. I mean, I really believe as a therapist that that's true. You know, I don't know why I should believe it otherwise, because I'm a therapist. That sounds a little dumb now to think about. But it all sort of revolves around the spiritual me. And it would be hard to say that any one of these was more important than the other, though probably where I'll get into the most treated feeling uh, uh, trouble mostly is in, in the in a, you know my, my feelings being somehow or another damned up I know that when I start dealing with the chemically dependent person boy I've got a well of feelings in there that are just you know anger hostility, shame, guilt all these negative feelings and you know what what I'm trying to get to is good feelings, his positive feelings. You know, I've got to be willing to, to recognize the first thing is going to start coming up are negative feelings, you know. And that's such a painful process that many people will pull out of therapy. So. What are you going to do with those people? Well, I don't know. Well, you can tell them. Well, we have a little trick. Uh, I, it's very interesting. Uh, again, uh, uh, we'll get into that in AA, but I want to talk about AA, but... But it's a, it's a strange thing. We, you know, usually in AA, we, we don't push the, uh, the God thing much. Please uh, hear how I'm saying that. And uh, we got a chapter in the big book called We Agnostics. I remember a real good friend of mine who's been in program about 10 years now. He said, i got to be with you guys. I know you. what you're doing works. I just can't handle that God thing. So you know, people say, it's all right. Hey, look, you got to believe in something stronger than you. Stick with the winners. We're sober, you're not. Stop drinking, come to meetings. Interesting thing happens. Almost without exception. Suddenly they find some sort of spiritual thing in there. No. Because that's all of our destiny is to find that. So we just don't worry about it. They say, uh, I must always find it. Okay, we talked about the spouse, and I'm going to <coughs> kind of review <coughs> what I said when I was talking about enabling. I'm sorry that you can't see that over here, but here's what the inside of that feeling wheel of the enabling person kind of grows to be spiritual. God will take care of it, everything. Forgetting faith without works is dead. Right? God will take care of everything. Total unrealistic. You know, what happens when he doesn't? I'm mad at him. Right? Okay, emotional anger, fear, and shame are the bottom feeling emotions of the the spouse, the protector of the family system. Physically, they're weak and tired a lot of the time. Mental, they're preoccupied with caring for the dependent and the concept peace at all costs. <coughs> Whatever it takes, my God, we've got to keep this thing together. Don't rock the boat, don't make waves. The will, they're responsible for everything. That's their will. They're going to be responsible. They'll take charge of the whole world, their family, everything. Their outside behavior is compliant, serious, serious, passive, 
They tell them they're always wrong. You know, nothing they do is working, but and they're martyred. Oh my, are they martyred? Please, I don't say that in any judgmental sense. That's just it is. Self pity. Oh. Now, <clears throat> this is a model that that comes from Weichscheider. But <clears throat> I've got to tell you that if I talk with a family of, of alcoholics uh, in which there's chemical dependency, and they start describing a child, they so fit these molds that I can almost tell you which child it is in the family structure. The, no, the first child in the family usually becomes the hero and the caretaker within the family. Backstopping mom, see? Quite often, more often than not, he's a very high achiever. <coughs> he's a good kid. He pleases everyone. And he's very responsible. Inside, fear, inadequacy, guilt, and he's very lonely. And, but, <coughs> boy, he doesn't get much help because he's doing what we say good kids do. Family hero. Where he's going to have problems is his interpersonal relationship. And these are the ones that go off and find an emotional cripple to marry. Why? Because that's all they know is taking care of somebody. Well, it just makes no rational sense to have grown up in a home where dad's drunk all the time or mom's drunk all the time and go out and find yourself a nice, comfortable drunk to marry. That doesn't make any sense. But it happens over and over and over, and, uh, and that caretaking role is so strong that families that break up, you know, couples that break up, the wife that's married to a drunk or the, or the husband that's married to a drunk, go marry another one. And, and you tell me that's rational? Hero caretaker. If we had time, we'd do some sculpturing, because when we sculpt this family, you can see these rules very vividly. Okay, the, the number two child usually is the number two child. He's the problem child. He's the scapegoat. Okay. He's quiet, he's sullen, and he's very manipulative. He's withdrawn. Here's a very important point. He has a strong peer group. That peer group becomes his fantasy family. Why? He's getting nothing from his family. See, the hero is getting all the praise. He's doing the right things. By the time this kid comes along, the family's so bent out of shape that he can't get any support from any of them. It's all going to the dad, and the hero's keeping everybody alive. He's the only thing we can put any pride in. Here comes this kid diddly bopping around. He ain't getting anything. And so his peer group becomes his fantasy family. And I'm convinced that emotional cripples attract emotional cripples. So these kids clump together. And they get into chemicals. Very early. Very, very early on. What's in the center of this feeling, child? Anger, fear. The predominant feeling is hurt. See? Hurt. You're not getting any love. There's no room for the love to that child except in a surface way. Now, remember one thing. And I love all my children, and I really wanted children. I wouldn't have had six. I, early on, I really figured out why it was happening. I wanted it to happen, so I had six. And it's very hard. My 16-year-old <clears throat> has been with me since age two, every single day but two days in his life, you know? Little guy would come in when he was two years old, crawl out the bed and me, say, I'm going to get you warm, Daddy. You know, just never been out of his sight. <coughs> and, and I really love him with all my heart. <coughs> it was very difficult for me to understand when this child began, began to have difficulty, hey, it doesn't matter what my feelings for him are, it's his perception of my feelings that count. Because down in the well of that child... He's not this one, but what he's feeling is that if I, you know, if I loved him, I wouldn't have done those things. 
It's his perception of it. And that's what the child is perceiving, this problem child, is that nobody loves him. The only love he gets out of here, and it's pretty phony, he's not getting much jealousy of the other family, jealousy of the, of the kingdom of the dependent person, jealousy of the, of the hero. The only way he has of getting any attention at all is all of these things that he's doing. Lonely. Problem child. Isn't that always true just for the second child? No, but generally that's the way it falls. Whether they had more or not. That's, that's always the second child where they had three or four. You know, the, the fact is that a lot of these things are true of any family structure. And I think it's important to think of the family as a system. Okay? Think of it as a mobile. You know, when the mobiles are chained down. If you got a mobile hanging up here with a lot of different parts on it, and you take a clothespin and you put on the mobile, it pulls the whole thing out of kilter. And all families have some of these aspects. The number one child in almost any family is usually the most achieving child. And the number two child, if they're three, <clears throat> doesn't get quite the thing. He's neither fish nor fowl. He's not the baby and he's not the oldest. You know, it's just that in a chemically dependent family, these things get pushed and locked in pathologically, much like the chemically dependence, chemically dependent person's uh, defenses get locked in. <coughs> and this is the pitiful one, the, the lost child. By the time he comes around, they're hardly aware he's there. He's withdrawn. It's very hard. He's shy. It's hard to relate to this little guy. He didn't let you see his feelings. You know, remember that in this family, everybody's trying to keep peace at any cost. Now, that's not normal for a little guy, right? But every time he starts being trying to express his feelings as a little guy in a normal way, everybody clouds up and rains all over him. Don't do that. She'll make mom do that or dad do that. Quickly, the message that comes to this old guy before he's four or five years old is, you better be quiet. You better not rock the boat. If we buy, uh, as I do, whether it's brought in or whatever, that, that, our, that our responses to our emotions are locked in, you know, pretty early on, and that if you take a baby and you put him in an incubator and you keep the temperature exactly right and you keep him fed just right but you don't stroke him during the first few months he'll die absolutely die if he doesn't have that stroking and love and tenderness that he gets whatever magic we transmit to our babies so no doubt in my mind that that's you know early on he's picking up the message that I better pull back that's why we call him a lost child. He's quiet. He gets solitary rewards. I used to watch my lonely child, you know, sit out playing by himself. His own little world. Remind me of the song by Neil Diamond, Shallow. You know, little child that just had a fantasy playmate. And that's where he gets his rewards. He's ignored. They don't mean to ignore him. My God, at the time of my height of my chemical dependency, my house was so crazy. You know, my, care I mean, my, my caretaker was doing one thing, my hero was doing something else, my scapegoat was doing something else, the net result was, you know, the crazy factor was, you know, about as high as it could get. And the lost child just was forgotten. That was the way he perceived it. Question? <laughs> Cases where people were real strong instances of say, this forgotten and lost child, and say the very first one. Uh, oh yeah, it's important to recognize that they're overlappings in these things. You know, that this is, these are stereotypical, but pretty typical and pretty accurate. But there's overlapping. For example, is is my forgotten child became the only child. He began to pick up some hero aspects, see? some caretaker aspects, and then some scapegoat aspects. You know, he just, he just dipped over, and it depended upon his reacting, see? Remember, caretaking and enabling is reacting to what happens to the alcoholic. 
You know, we're doing a, a two-person ballet. Your turn to curtsy, my turn to bow. Is there a one-class personality that takes effect for the following day if this does the other? I don't think so. You know, it's like saying, which came first, the chicken or the egg? But we recognize in, in AA, as opposed to the modality of treatment I have, that there, and we say and we read in chapter 5 every time, certain of us have grave underlying emotional problems but are still able to reach sobriety if we're able to be honest with ourselves. You know, I've known people that went to their first meeting, got right into the program, you know, reached amazing degree of sobriety very quickly. I had to work for every struggling step of it, you know. I don't know how crazy I was when I started. You know, and, you know, it's like I said <clears throat> at the beginning of this, that whether you're from the painful group, emotionally unstable, if you will, or people that are not dealing with it, or the normal group, or the euphoric group, hey, it seems to still be one in ten. And that's the key point. Okay. Inside this little lost child, it's confusion. My God, he can't make sense out of any of it. And hurt. Most of all, loneliness. You know, he's alone in this crowded house of people. Inadequate feelings. Fearful feelings. Anger. You know, anger. And one thing that's absolutely prevalent throughout every chemical dependent family I've ever seen or read about is that they're all shame based shame based shame differs from guilt in this regard if I feel guilty about something it presupposes that I can take some sort of action to relieve the guilt I can make amends to the person offended to God to somebody shame is talking about who I am not what I've done see dreadful feeling shame chemically dependent families are shame based oh they got a lot to feel guilty about to be sure you know Finally, they have the family pet or the mascot. Now, this little guy learns early on. Uh, oh, way to make out with this crazy bunch of nuts. Be funny. Be a clown. Make a lot of noise. You know, he seems to salvage some sort of distorted self-esteem or something. But, you know, and and so often I'll see the guy, you know, and he's in trouble or he's in jail or something. You know. Usually it's referred to some... Well, I've got Chaplin to refer to me young lady. Because when she got drunk, she went out and did these crazy things. And when she came home, her husband threw off, bounced off the wall. You know, it began to dawn on her that whatever else was going wrong, you know, drinking was not doing anything but getting her bounced off the wall. See? But the thing that I'm looking at is I got a unit of two people here. I'm not sure which one's the sickest. Right now, I've got the alcoholic. In other cases, I've got the spouse. Yeah. The objective, uh, however, is to treat the whole family. And obviously, the family is not going to reach any real healthy balance until you ultimately reach, reach the chemically dependent person. Yeah. Let's take a break.
Okay, I want to talk. Uh, I'm going to have to move along pretty fast because uh, if we're going to finish at four, uh, I've got more material than I. I don't know how we got to this point of not catching up where I ought to be. But I want to talk about the thing that I think should interest you more than almost anything I'm going to talk about, and that's intervention. I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about the treatment process, but that's uh, kind of left to the professionals, uh, except as your role in it, and I think it is a very important role as a pastor. Remember, we're talking about spiritual bankruptcy. Okay. Also, I'm going to talk to you about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going to talk to you about it because it's surprising how many pastors feel it's a threat. Now, I've heard this, literally, heard this. Son, your faith in God will set you free. Now, that's essentially true. I believe that. But that's like saying that the acts of the, during, during the acts of the apostles that they laid hands on and healed, I believe that healing happens sometimes. But if I get a cancer and you can whack out, I'm not going to sit around and wait on it. I mean, I don't mind you come put your hands on me. I'm not putting this down, mind you. You know, I'm simply saying that to get ahead of myself a little bit, just as I feel that medicine is God's answer to our physical suffering, dentistry to our tooth problems, psychologists to our emotional problems. I believe that Alcoholics Anonymous is God's answer to this terrible disease that's ripping us asunder. Believe me, it is ripping us asunder, this nation. Chemical dependency. Okay. <coughs> Intervention is, I think if, if Vernon Johnson and Johnson Institute had made their mark in the field of alcohol, alcoholism and chemical dependency treatment, it's in the area of intervention that they've done the most significant work. Remember, the chemically dependent person never seeks treatment spontaneously there has to be a crisis. Remember that we used to think that he had to bottom out or he wouldn't get any help. Unfortunate thing was sometimes before he bottomed out he blew his brains out. Besides, look at the toll of suffering if we wait for that to happen. What we've learned is we can intervene and create the crisis. Literally create the crisis. first thing that we have to do is to identify the key persons surrounding the chemically dependent person. Now that key person might well be yourself, one of them. Hopefully it will be. It's going to sure make the job easier because we need you. We really need a pastor. Usually, however, it's the spouse or an older child. Key person would be anybody, including the four-year-old child, because I've used them in interventions. Okay. Got to identify who these people are. And then I've got to get them into a professional and start training them to take this sucker home. Okay. Is there any way to... You know, determine if a person is alcoholic, being a pastoral, you know, and meeting with some of my members. You know, just recently I've learned of a case and I didn't even realize it. You know, I've been there two years. They've held, you know, kept it quiet or... Remember... You know, somehow, is there any way to tell? Remember, it's a family secret. I think you tell uh, the, 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 the section in the handout that I didn't go over in great detail is symptoms of. I think when I start seeing DUIs and things like that, when I see, start seeing people losing jobs, when I start seeing children that suddenly start running amok, 
these are all, they don't necessarily point to chemical dependency, but when you start getting them in concert, you can start making some assumptions. And if you can get key persons to talk to you, and this involves trust, every bit of skill that you have as a pastor to develop this trust relationship. And in that regard, you know, I have to do the same thing as a therapist. I can't do anything that the person trusts me. You know, and I may spend a lot of time just developing that before, you know, the phenomenon of transference takes place. <laughs> and the same thing happens in the pastor, for, uh, parishioner. Uh, you know, you're, no, you're not worth a fig as a pastor until you start developing that relationship one-on-one -on -one to your parishioners, right? Isn't that true? You build up a trust. Okay. Uh, I'm not trying to evade your question. It's just very involved, and I'll be glad after we finish to talk about some of the more aspects of it. But I think that if you will do some reading, then you'll become more cognizant and aware of, see? Most of us don't want to see it. Now, that's the honest fact, because we know what it means. It means a lot of rough work. And so we buy off on, and that's the way we become professional enablers, sort of. We buy off on what the family's telling us. Here's what's really going on. The guy's just having a lot of problems. And da -da 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 -da. Yes, sir. But isn't even one of the points that it's not always going to be that simple to identify because of the craftiness and cleverness? Oh, you, you bet. Sure. And suppose that the chemical is this volume. You know, the, the, the only thing is that the two most things that we, we jump up and down and recognize are quick is our alcoholism and drug, you know, street drug addiction. That's a, a long way from being the only chemically dependent persons. You know, one of the toughest of all is the one that some doctor's written prescription on. Because that nobleness that I'm taking what my doctor, now wait a minute, don't you talk to me about that. My doctor gave that to me. How many times have I heard that? Oh. Yeah, makes it legitimate. Yeah. Please don't think I'm putting doctors down. I'm not. I do think we could do more in medical schools about teaching this. About this. Uh, I read uh, recently, well, it's been a few months back, that uh, a pastor, however, can be prosecuted for giving advice at this particular point. And uh, particularly if it's going in uh, uh, contrary to uh, position, and, uh, and he could be sued for it. More than he's worth. And we've got this third of uh, one million dollars, five hundred to an all I guess it comes down to where we all reach at some point in, 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 in our professional existence. Sometimes I have to take the bull by the horns. Now, I'm not saying that we don't take into consideration what you're saying because it could be a real problem. And also, if I've got some person that say is on lithium carbon carbonate for bipolar depression, and I, you know, I falsely read the situation to say this person's chemically dependent, let's come off the lithium, kid, and they code into depression and blow their brains out. I've misread the situation. That's why we need the professional into the picture. We need the medical doctor. We need the savvy doctor. You know, we, I believe in a team approach. You know, for example. Uh, when I get a patient in, I want to send him to a psychologist to get a complete uh, workup, mental test workup. It's just another tool. You know, I want to get blood work. I'm not competent to read it, but I can sure get a doctor that can. You see? And, and I want to get a pastor involved because he's best apt to be able to lead the person into the spiritual growth process that I know is necessary for recovery. And that's why I think that that I certainly don't want to be floating along or, uh, alone out here with all these people that are very sick. I've got a lot of experience, but I certainly don't feel I'm infallible in it by any means, by any stretch, wild stretch of the imagination. And it may be that what you have to say will be exactly what I need to hear, you see. Get over the doctor. I, what I'm saying is that if I've got a person that manifestly is alcoholic, I am going to very safely say to that person, look, friend, you know, I don't care who's giving you this stuff. You're not going to get sober as long as you keep taking your happy pills. And I don't have any hesitancy whatsoever about doing that. I don't care who it angers. Yes. 
That opens up another aspect related to what you said, and that is the business of getting for the system set up to manufacture the prices and generate the prices. When you have a loophole like this, obviously a doctor is going to be a big key factor in this particular individual situation. If you don't have that loophole plug, now let's talk about plugging it. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is get these significant people and I'm going to evaluate them in two areas. Do they know enough about the illness of chemical dependency to see that the, the alcoholic or other chemical dependent person is unable to help seek help voluntarily? Do they know that? <laughs> and are these people emotionally adequate to intervene? I may have to prepare them for the intervention. Usually I do. What if you do to this right person's patient and tell you that they're not responding to the health problem? Pardon? Oh. Well, somebody's gotten them to my attention. Yeah. There's somewhere I can start. Well, it happened to me not lately. Was supposedly going in for a heart attack, but mm -hmm. I knew the reason why. I was asking, you know, how was the problem for a daughter and a doctor? You got very attentive. Oh, yeah, well, that's a tough one. You know, the only thing I can start doing is gathering information in order to be able to do the intervention. Remember, we've got to do the intervention on the in, on the codependent. You know, and part of that intervention is to break through their delusional system, their denial system, that there's a problem in the family. No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we that's what we've got to do. Look, there's no question, but sometimes I can't break through. And in that case, the person's just going to have to keep crisising. No. And if I keep in contact with these people, and sometimes I lose contact with them. I would lose contact quicker than you would if he, you know, might be a parishioner unless they just withdraw from Quite often they withdraw from any association of the church, but they're still in your, in your flock, as it were. But as a therapist, when they stop coming, I'll keep trying to reach them, send them letters, call them, do all these sorts of things. But I might lose them. See, remember, can't fix them. Yes. The bottom line. I mean, if you give these someone's task, you've got to love them enough to run the risk. You've got to love them enough you, to run the risk. You've got to bite the bullet, and if you're afraid of offending because you have a need to be the nice guy and love, then you're going to let them down. Yeah, I think that's why recovered do pretty well in the field because. What you see is yourself, and you're more apt to say, hey, let me tell you something. Let me work with me. You know, oh, you are a garden variety drunk. Okay, let's quit playing games with each other. What you're saying is what I've said. And I can share with him. You know, make him believe this. Make him understand this. I've tried that. It didn't work for me. It might work for you. Or... Hey, look, I don't know. You may not call yourself an alcoholic. I did all those things, and I call myself a drunk. See? Okay. What we're trying to do is get these people focused in, strong enough emotionally to intervene. Now, we prepare these people specifically for the intervention. How do we do that? Okay. We prepare a written list of specific instances incidents or conditions. In other words, I don't say, look, Dad, you've just been drinking too much. I'll say, Dad, I can't bring my friends home anymore. Because three times in the last three months I've come in, he's been laying naked on the living room floor. Okay. Specific. Specific information. Not vague generality. If you can ring the employer in, you really got a hound. See? Okay, now, I've got to be aware in the intervention sy system that, you know, given my druthers, I would like to send someone to somewhere like Fellowship Hall or Peachford for a 28-day treatment <laughs> modality. And you really focus in 24 hours a day. You know, some people simply can't, either monetarily, job-wise, or what have you. So I've got to have alternatives. Uh, the alternative might be an outpatient program such as I conduct. 
It's tougher because it requires more commitment. And I lose some. And I try to get the lose, you know, the one I'm to lose it into an in-hospital situation. Okay. We need to have the family know the alternatives because what I'm going to try to do is get this guy to get some help. In order to do that, I can't say you can just got to get some help, Dad. <laughs> I got to know where we want him to go. Okay. Then we try to predict with the family and other significant people his most likely excuses of why he's not a drunk. Remember, each, each one comes at it in, in a slightly different way. We try to anticipate what he's going to say and prepare answers to that. And then we actually rehearse the thing. Sit down and say, okay, I'll bring one of my therapists in or I'll act as if somebody else doing an image and we'll, I'll be the drum. That's not hard to do at all. See? And when you come in to me with one thing, I'll come up with an excuse. See? And let them see the reality of how tough this is going to be. Because remember, this is a family secret. Remember, peace at all costs. Remember, fear, shame, all of these things are working down in the gut of these people that you're trying to get ready to do an intervention on the chemically dependent person in the family. It takes courage, building of the strength to believe, believe that they can do this. Okay. Would you need to treat the neighbor? Quite often, yes. I mean, in the same process, of yeah, remember that we had the six recovery steps of the enabler, and, and I found that, well, oh, if I can get this person in, that's usually the best, you know, if I can start working with her. Do you treat both, that, both of them at the same time, or at no, I usually the enabler can't. first? I usually can't get, you know, like I said, sometimes I'll see the alcoholic first, sometimes I'll see the codependent first. Mm -hmm. But if I'm seeing the codependent, what I'm always thinking is intervention, intervention, intervention. See? I got to remember she's sick. She, he or she needs emotional recovery, spiritual recovery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also in the back of my mind, I'm going to get to him. I want to get to him. See? But you just can't call that person that's so well guarded in and say, hey, your husband's a drunk. Let's go get him. <laughs> it's not going to work. Okay. So in essence, what we do then is we, we get specific information about the person's behavior. We determine what is most likely uh, the excuses will be because they've heard them all. And we rehearse them. Now, when he comes in, we sit him down and we say, and, and it's all done non-judgmentally with as much love as those people. And you have to, boy, you got some anger in there, let me tell you. You got some real angry people and you've got to, sometimes you'll have to say to this child or this person, you better not be here. No, you can't deal with the hostility and anger and rage you feel at your mother or father. Because that's what he's going to latch on. If you jump in, he's going to say, I'm not going to talk with you people. I don't know what you're ganging up on me for, but, you know. He's going to likely say that anyway, but if I have rehearsed these people, they give specific instances over this period of time of what this person is behaving. What am I doing? I am forcing a break in that delusional defensive system that I told you had become pathological. I'm going to crack through the denial. Crack through his projecting on, you know, well, of course I'm doing that. It's because you're such a bitch. That's why I'm drinking. See? When she calmly has to be in my hand and say, well, you're supposed to be really going on. It's been going on since thus and so. Remember, he's been repressing things. He really doesn't remember, but when you've got a child that says, if I had one child day, twice when my girlfriend was over, you came in thinking you were in the bath bathroom and urinated on the curtain. Twice you didn't get that. It's not easy for that child. It's not easy for that person to sit and listen to that. But I'll tell you what it starts doing, it starts cracking it down. Do they always work? Of course not. And what we try to do is have an alternative. Will you go into treatment? 
No, I can do it on my own. I'll go to AA. Okay, fine. But if that doesn't work, will you do this? And you get commitments, you see, that you've never been able to get from this person before. And when it works, it really works. Takes a lot of work. Takes a lot of skill. Uh, it takes uh, the realization that I can't make people well, but sometimes these techniques will work. And like you say, you've got to bite the bullet and take the risk. Because let me tell you, it is a frightening thing to confront a hostile, enraged alcoholic. You know, even when he's not drinking. Because he's a bomb ready to explode. Come in, Brother Al. Well, do you uh, confront them even if you prefer they have a problem? I'm sorry? Do you confront these people? They like if you heard that somebody in your church or on the base had a drinking problem and, you know, it's been hush hush, how would you go about intervening? Would you? You know, and everybody wants to keep it quiet. The family wants to keep it quiet. I don't think I would. I don't think I could really make much of a headway in that situation unless somebody asked for something you from me. Yeah, you know, I might. I might in my in my pastoral duties and talking with someone, ask them. You know, you know, seem, things seem to be rather tense. You want to talk about it and try to elicit the information and to give you a place to check in. But you can't bully your way into the to the situation if somebody asked for it. Well, then, then that. Isn't that, uh, I know it, it has to be done, but isn't that kind of bad because it seems like the situation gets to the critical stage before, you know, you can get to it? Well, you can, you can take this intervention step at any process after the third, you know, after we go into that beyond the social and into the addictive stage of the disease. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the sooner, the better and the more successful your chances are going to be. Because remember, the longer he's going down in this downward spiral, the more pathologically his defense system gets, the more his delusions grow. See? It's good. Wait till they make a move and you don't. Well, I, I, I just, it's just, I hesitate to walk in there. I, I would have to see the situation in terrain, as I say, in after school. Mm -hmm. I, I would be hard put not to move if I thought I could make some headway on any one of those people, consistent with you know, not treading where angels fear to go. I mean, I just think it's a, a thing that takes all of your skill, and my skill as a professional therapist, yours as a pastor. But isn't that true of any situation where you see a dysfunctional family? How about if, uh, if uh, <coughs> the people are, are involved in some really unhealthy sexual things, for example, that you know is going to tear the family apart? It would tear any family apart until you approach it. Can you approach it? You know, I think it depends on the situation. Depends on the trust level you have with any family member. Depends on their willingness to become involved and their wanting to be helped. And, and it would seem to me that that would be true on any aspect of what the pastor has to do. You know, if people come into your church of a Sunday, one can suppose they've come to hear something, right? And so you give them the word. Okay. That's one aspect of what I see the role of, of the preacher. And then the pastor role is would seem to me to be somewhat different. Now, you know, I'm stepping over in your ear and telling you what, you know, what I, but I'm just saying what I see is a pastor or any professional in the helping field. And there are times when I can go out and give the word. In my area, I know that, for example, if I have the fortunate opportunity to go as I did one time and speak to the All American Junior Enlisted Wives Club. Great young lady, bunch of young ladies, all in their early twenties. Then I'm just going to talk about this disease. Somebody's going to come see me and talk to me. Almost, I almost, almost can plan on it. They're worried, you know, and that gives me a chance to say, hey, my advice is thus and so, and I may not hear from the person ever again. Or an opportunity I had to speak one time to the installation volunteer coordinator for Fort Bragg, and someone came out up, up afterwards and said, I've got this dear friend 
ring, my ears always go up and say, the person's describing themselves to me, but it really wasn't. That's having this problem. It, it sounds like what you're talking about. I said, sure sounds like it to me. It was two or three months, see, before that person had able, was able to get her friend to do something. So I guess that's what I'm saying, you know, in answer to what you're saying to me, is I don't know. There are no absolutes in any of this. You just have to take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I like to get at that from the military side of the house, not in terms of speaking about it, but the referral that is told to see the chaplain because this is all now becoming command action. But he really doesn't want to see the chaplain, but he has to see And meantime, everybody else is saying, not that chaplain, he's all knowing and everything, and he's going to help get this thing you're straightened out because I don't know what to do with alcoholics as you hear the company commander is fine running through. Um, what would you suggest as a, in general, rule as a point of, of departure? Because if the guy obviously is not looking for help here, well, I think that when somebody's referred him to me because official cognizance, however, it's come into it, I've got a terrible, I've got a very effective hammer there. See, if I learn about the disease, and I can talk to him in concrete terms. I may not break through his denial, but I got him, sort of, see? It's like when people get an operational awareness. You know, I hate to, for it to reach that point because if they're a career person, you kind of death nail promotion. Let's face it, they're already being what it is. I it's been 23 years in there, you know, not to realize that if I, I get down on my record that I'm a recovered alcoholic, hey, come on now. I'm up promotion from lieutenant colonel to full colonel. What they're trying to find out is how I can cut this highly outstanding group of people down to the smaller number of slots I've got. So let's be realistic about if they get into official channels, you're going to lose career things. And this is incidentally, you know, my message to any of the commanders that I talk with is that, hey, you've got a group of people that aren't being reached. I are one. Nobody reached me. There was no way in the world I would have gone to anybody. In other words, what you're saying is that the hammer is that you've got a crisis that's being generated. Right. You use the crisis, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. Okay. Military really has a better uh, position than that than the pastor does. Would you, would well, yeah, I think uh, in many respects that's true. Yeah, I think that's true in many respects. Uh, the... The thing about the intervention is the hammer is always implied. You know, you, you get the spouse, you know, the spouse has really got very few options. They can stay and continue in the role of terror and whatever it is that's happening in the alcoholic family. They can leave or they can do something. But being progressive as it is and chronic, it ain't going to get any better without help. And that's what you're doing with the spouse is you're trying to get them strong enough and knowledgeable enough about what's happened to their, the person they love and to themselves so that they can reach into the point and get to the intervention stage. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into a, a, a lot of details on intervention, but I recommend strongly, if you want to know about this, uh, there's a rather complete outline in the brochure that you've gotten that talks about it in some detail. And Fort Bragg has a film, too, uh, all personal, not standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. And Johnson's just new, done a new film on intervention. Any questions about intervention per se? Okay. We've intervened, all right? Or somehow or another we've got the chemically dependent person to treatment of some kind. What happens? Okay. We recover in stages from chemical dependency. And when I say recover, probably a better term would be we put into remission and recover spiritually, however you want to approach it. And predictable, almost inevitable stages. We go through denial, 
of the compliant and defiant acceptance and surrender. Okay? Denial, which we've been dancing around all day, is the biggie. Denial in the face of what's going on with a chemically dependent person defies the rational person's credibility. I mean, just get incredulous. It does not make any sense. Uh, at the time that I had my first crisis, I was drinking a fifth a day. That was my maintenance dose, dose in order to feel normal. Now, like a great number of alcoholics that I've known and have read about, I was a very, at that point, a very successful alcoholic. Okay. I was doing the job that I was being paid to do and making some significant contributions to the, the area that I was in. I was taking care of four children by myself, running the home, doing all these things. Okay. But the consumption was increasing. My spirituality was getting, my spiritual repository was getting expended more and more until I was becoming totally spiritual back right. And I knew I had a problem. I just couldn't assess it correctly. Okay. My maintenance dose in order to feel normal was a fifth a day. And I ran five miles every morning. <laughs> every morning. <laughs> and when we talk about tolerance that, it, uh, that a chemically dependent person fills up, you got to believe that it's real tolerant. You know. But the amount that I was drinking meant that there was no time in a period of almost two years that I was ever sober. Ever. You know, just in terms of the amount of, of, uh, of alcohol that the body can detoxify or metabolize in a 24-hour period. You know, I was, I was running a deficit all the time. Now, periodically, starting with weekends, but growing, I would have some serious drinking. See, serious drinking. And at that time, this manifested itself on me merely withdrawing into my room, laying in a good supply. Occasionally, wonder wonders, I'd have a physical problem that would allow me to be quartered, and I was off and running. See, if I could just be quartered. I began to have withdrawal symptoms when I stopped drinking those heavy amounts. But I didn't time to my drinking. Can you believe that? Didn't time to my drinking. I mentioned to you my, my record, I guess, was 14 gallons of 14 gallons. And that presented the withdrawal symptoms that were prim. I guess we're talking about denial. I'm going to tell you how strong it is. Among other things that was happening, I raised up right in my bed. 12.45 one night because the band of the 82nd Airborne Division was playing in my front yard. They were playing the All-American song. And I somehow or another got myself to the door. There wasn't any band there. It was the first time I'd ever had a, an oral hallucination. The radio was playing out of the air conditioner and I couldn't change the station. I began to see things. And I'm walking across the floor, and I went whoppo right on my face because my motor nerves are short circuit. Okay, I was going through all these terrible withdrawals, just awful. I mean, you know, hangovers of child's play compared with severe chemical withdrawal. And what I would do is I would take four days' leave, get a day of grace. So I'd have a weekend to start, four days leave, a day of grace, another weekend. That was a long drunk. And I would plan these. But, you know, but I was still trying to think, you know, I've got to do my job. So I planned it around times when I had crazy things to do. Okay. I've done this several times in one day. I've done this twice, but instead of asking for four days, I asked for three days. You know, I was AWOL. After 22 years of meeting thousands of formations and never even being late, I was absent when I officially 
Now, my assessment of that situation was a lot, you know, I made it a lot graver than it really was. I already had my retirement orders. What are they going to do? Box me, throw me out. That's not the way I read it. What I read was, you've really done what the bad guys did. Two colonels came looking for him. My housekeeper, who had become a very outstanding enabler for him, you know, went to the door and said, he ain't here, he's sick. I don't know where he is. Got rid of these people. Well, I knew I had a problem. See, that was my crisis. And behind me lived the hospital <coughs> commander, just a prince of a guy by the name of Colonel Austin. <coughs> I went over to him and I said, sir, I gotta have some help. He said, I've, I've been praying to come over. Nobody can go through what you're going through. Well, I laid down conditions before I go on his neuropsychiatric board. You can believe this. I know you all people are looking for me. I can hardly stand up. I'm so uh, whacked out from drinking all that booze. I wouldn't go in unless they guaranteed to give me something to sleep. And a lot of it. And I forgot.